Welcome to our afternoon panel discussion where we will be talking about the role of primary and behavioral health integration and in suicide prevention. I am excited to introduce you to our expert panelists. Dr. Jeffrey Rado is the Associate Professor of Psychiatry and Behavioral Health Sciences and Medicine at Northwestern University. Dr. Nita Leitirapong is the Associate Professor of Medicine and the Associate Director of Clinical Outcomes for the Center for Chronic Disease Research and Policy at the University of Chicago. And Dr. Neha Gupta is an Assistant Professor of Psychiatry and Internal Medicine at Rush University Medical Center. Hello, it's nice to Hi. see you all. Hi. So as before we get started with our questions, I would actually like each of you to please briefly describe your behavioral health integration program. Dr. Rado, can you start? Sure, I'll, I'll go ahead and start. So I'm at Northwestern and we have been doing integrated um, mental health care in primary care for probably about the last uh, four years, three, four years. And we've used primarily the collaborative, collaborative care model um, based on the AIMS Center model from the University of Washington. So that's uh, using a care manager in primary care, in the primary care clinic, um, working really in collaboration with the, the primary care provider and the consulting psychiatrist. I'm one of them in, in some, some of the clinics, working together to sort of create a plan to treat both, we treat both depression and anxiety and using really kind of all the kind of sort of key parts of the collaborative care model. So we have a, a registry in our EMR and we follow patients over time and we use a measurement-based care treatment to target using PHQ-9 and GAD-7. And we use medications combined with care calls and psychotherapy with really the goal of getting patients as close as possible to remission. Thank you. Dr. Lai yeah, happy to talk about it. So we have a little bit of a different program. Um, uh, I direct the primary care behavioral health integration program here. Um, our vision is to really try to create seamless physical and mental health care um, for the University of Chicago community, including our patients and providers and staff. Um, so we actually have taken, we don't have a collaborative care model. Um, we aspire to have one. Um, we have um, basically, we've been trying to change the culture around mental health for like the last five years, I would say, um, trying to use data to decrease, to increase awareness of the problem, problems with referrals, deep, remove treatment barriers. Um, one of the central tenets to our vision is increasing the capacity of our primary care providers to screen, manage, and triage mental health problems themselves, um, and then emphasize the development of clinical decision support tools that can bring first-line psychiatric care and psychological care um, to our patients, and then leveraging the EHR, the electronic health record, to sort of manage things. We have a registry and you know, uh, help with screening and, and monitoring symptoms. We do have an integrated behavioral health clinic. Um, it is run, it's run based on the primary care behavioral health model, run by two outstanding health psychologists, um, Dr. Dr. Fabiana Rujo and Nancy Beckman. And they also that clinic also serves as a training site for many um, health psychology trainees. Hi, yes, so so um you know, our model has a lot of similarities to Dr. Rado's model at Northwestern. Um, so, so we also follow the AIMS model of care. I think some of the key differences or some, something unique is that, um, is that our recruitment of patients is quite, uh, quite large. So we've been in effect our collaborative care program, which is a depression screening program or has been up until this, up until now. Um, it, it actually, it, it's, um, it's really physician metric driven. So we've implemented the PHQ-2 and 9 into the annual best practice advisories for all primary care providers, neurology providers, OBGYN, and oncology. Um, so it's something that needs to be done on an annual basis. So that's really brought in patients to our program. And we also have the inclusions into our registry being um, 
low to moderate scoring Colum uh, CSSRS patients, so on the Columbia screen, and also a, man a manual referral into our program. Um, so, so we've been in effect as a, as a similar model to Dr. Rado's since 2016, spanning 41 clinics across the health system. Um, and most recently, um, we redesigned this to follow the AIMS model and have implemented the billing structures for that. So. Thank you. Dr. Gupta, while I still have you, I'm wondering if you can speak um, about why integrating behavioral and primary care has been important in your health system and um, more specifically to suicide prevention. Sure. So, so you know, the, the need really came up about almost five years ago when the uh, U.S. Preventative uh, Task Force uh, really noticed that depression screening in primary care providers was, was very low. So, so there was definitely a need for a universal depression screen, which is what brought, um, you know, champions from psychiatry and also family medicine to, um, to really write a grant on bringing in a collaborative care program, uh, which is a partnership between social work care management, psychiatrists, and primary care. So that's sort of how this started. The, the biggest, um, you know, the reason it's been so important is because there's been such a gap in care between psychiatry and primary care. Um, it, it still exists very much there. We all know there's a shortage of psychiatrists and the wait, line, the wait times to see psychiatrists are very long. So there was really a need for a, I would say a value-based uh, chronic care management model that also ties in the specialty of psychiatry. And uh, specifically for suicide prevention, I'll, I'll say that, you know, really it's just, it's the, the theme of our model has been early detection and early screening. So um, this started in 2016, as I said, when we implemented this into our electronic health record EPIC, the question nine on the uh, PHQ-9, of course, asks about, uh, about um, suicidal ideation. And so that alone has increased uh, has, has served to have early detection and increased screening around, um, around suicidality. But the most important part of our program, which has led to its success, has been that we are guaranteeing a call, a, a response to that positive screen. So it, it really brings primary providers um, or even, you know, really the primary, even you know, some specialty care providers to feel reassured that there is a team-based approach responding, uh, you know, a team responding to those positive uh, suicidal screens. Dr. Lightyear Hong, would you like to speak to that as well? Sure, I would say, um, in addition, uh, I would say that other things that sort of elevate the importance of primary care behavioral health integration for our health system has probably been, um, the movement towards population health in general at our institution and probably same at the other institutions. Um, the change in payment structures like accountable care organizations where people are thinking of you know, total costs of care and then realizing, oh, a lot of our patients with mental health problems have physical health problems and their mental health, um, you know, they're not showing up to their psychiatry appointments or they can't get into the psychiatry department or are showing up for their therapy appointments, but hey, they're coming to primary care, let's move mental health care into primary care. So that way, um, you know, uh, two birds, one stone, decrease mental health stigma and try to get people engaged that way. And uh, so I would just add that the, the policy, the insurance changes, um, healthcare reform stuff that's been going on around population health. Dr. Rita. Sure. So I probably would echo what um, both Neha and Anita said, you know, some of the similar, similar reasons that we, we started our program. I think the biggest issue on a practical level was it was so hard to get behavioral health treatment for patients. And that was a real struggle for most of our primary care practices that, you know, as much as we have, I think a very robust psychiatry department, we could not meet, we don't have enough providers to meet the need for all, all of our primary care providers. So the program really leverages um, resources to get people into care very quickly and making access very open so, so people can get into care and then get into care quickly. And I think that was really meeting a huge need within our healthcare system. Um, and then I think as part of that, like, like Neha said, you know, we, uh, suicide is part of the screening. So we definitely can identify patients who 
either are suicidal or at high risk for suicide and then really try and implement interventions to help them sort of in, in real time. So in addition to trying to meet the needs of all of these patients, have there been other obstacles that you've overcome in your practice and how have you done so or how do you plan to do so? Dr. Rado, do you wanna start with that one? So there's lots of obstacles. I'm not okay. sure where to start. <laughs> you have time. Um, you're all right. I'd say there's I'd say there's been different obstacles at different points. So probably early on, we really had to get buy-in from the administration. So they had to really believe in the program and support it, because um, that's just the reality. You have to sort of make it happen. That you know you need you need the, the financial support to to put programs in place. So we did a pilot, and then over about a year, year and a half, and then we presented that data a lot of different places around the hospital, and I think from there there was buy-in really from leadership to implement this now in all of our, our primary care clinics. So it's now, now as she is now, does exist in all of the Northwestern primary care clinics. So that, so that was one issue. I think um, referrals have been a challenge. So we have, we've, you know, Neha hit on screening. Screening's a big issue and we've really tried to get screening going on a, on a large scale. And that's, it's, it, we've done, had some success. I think COVID set us back because it's been harder to, you know, with, in, with phone visits, it's harder to do screening. So we've kind of had a setback there, but that's something we're still working on, I think, to try and improve that and, and really trying to, to problem solve that issue. Um, I think the last thing I think of that was, that really had to happen was the IT support because this program is very much based in the electronic medical records. So we had to have workflow set up to make the referrals. We had to have a, a registry built in our EMR. And once we got that done, then it really makes the, 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 the program work. But we had to, you know, that took a lot of time, a lot of work, reworking it, re-looking at it, seeing what functioned, what didn't function. Um, but once we sort of, we got that down, then that's really been, it's been a godsend to, to make the program run smoothly. That wasn't so many. <laughs> Dr. Lake, I just gave you, I just gave you the top three. Oh. <laughs> okay. I can I can echo I can yeah. uh, chime in just a little bit uh, you know uh, from so I, I relate to to everything Jeff shared um, but you know as as the program has progressed some continued obstacles are unreachables unreachable patients so. Yes. You know, it'll 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 happen that the patient sees their primary yes. care provider and even sees them over video, but they just won't pick up for, yeah. for us, you know. So, um, so that's a big one. And um, yeah, I mean, I, I would say that those are those are the and another one. And this is getting a little more um, into the into the granular details, but it's a really important part of our programs is the is the caseload tracking from our behavioral health care managers. So um, even though. I, I know Jeff and I both have built our registries into our electronic health record, and even with it being epic, they're they're pretty slow to run. I mean, they they take a long time to pull up, and and so we're, you know, we're just not trying to find a way to make this a um, a, a sustainable workflow and process. Um, I would say those are the two that we're actively working on. Dr. Lai do you have? different obstacles or you're uh, similar? Uh, some are similar, like IT, um, I, I, I ended up getting boarded in informatics because of all the time I spent fixing informatics over the years that it met the clinical hours to, to get the board certification. So yes, echo the informatics for sure. <laughs> um, the, um, you know, our problems are a little different because we don't have a care, we don't have care managers who are sort of picking up everyone who screens positive for depression. So we really have had to give our clinicians a lesson and re-lessons about what are the different behavioral health providers that are out there? Who do you actually refer to like a partial hospitalization program or an intensive outpatient treatment program? Those are not terms that typically doctors or primary care providers know. Um, what's the difference between long-term therapy or behavioral medicine sort of short-term therapy program? What, is, what does that mean? Who's right to go where? Um, I think that has actually improved and the culture has changed in our primary care clinicians and they are able to take on more. Um, but it, it's sort of been, um, there's been a lot, my team sends out weekly tips every Friday about different behavioral health, um, you know, resources that are available, different education tips to try to really change the culture. Um, because, you know, like 
I, you know, when, when I stand up a collaborative care program here, our clinic is 25,000 patients. Like we will, our collaborative care managers will, will run out of space very quickly, you know? So having, um, so that's another problem. Um, the other problem is like for individual cases with insurance. So for example, patients who have Medicaid insurance or are underinsured, it can be very hard to find community therapists to take care of them. Um, and then a lot of times, same problem that Neha is having internally, patients don't answer the phone. So we, we actually have a partnership with about 12 community therapy groups and they can, they will actually, you know, contact our patients for us and, and reach out for them for therapy. And then patients don't answer the phone all the time. You know, they, they say yes to the primary care doctor, but they don't say yes to the therapist. And so we're also teaching the clinicians, what, how do you, how do you talk about therapy and make sure they really want it? Because we don't want to waste the therapist's time trying to reach out to patients. I, I would also echo, I didn't mention this, but yeah, we are also having a, this issue of unreachable patients. So the patients get referred and then the care manager just cannot track them down. And we're actually doing a study trying to look at that population to understand them better. You know, what, what are the issues with access? Why are they not, are they sort of engaging with the PCP but not engaging with us? And what are the issues that might be driving that? So we're trying to understand that factor better because I think it's one of the things that we really struggle with. You know, there's a, such a, a, a high no-show rate even when you refer people to psychiatry for the first time, there's a, there's a lot of stigma and other reasons why people don't want to even engage in mental health care. And I think we might be feeling a little bit of that as well here, where even though we're offering it really as a primary care service, it's in the primary care setting, it's with their PCP, it's very much sort of in the environment that they're comfortable with. I think there's still some factors that are that are sort of blocking sort of engagement with the program. We're trying to understand that better. Yeah, doctor, I was actually just gonna ask that if you thought some of that was the stigma of reaching out for mental health treatment versus physical health treatment. I think it may be, I mean, we really try and frame the program as sort of integrated with physical health and really part of being well overall. And we try not to sort of say it's depression or, you know, trying to use words that I think maybe are more um, palatable to people. But even then, I think there's still just people are, are, are resistant and, and, you know, we're trying to figure out ways to make it, make it better and, and make and improve engagement. So what resources, I'll, I'll start this with you, Dr. Gupta, what resources have you leveraged to integrate primary, primary care with behavioral health care? Sure, so, so really, you know, as Nita referenced early on, the um, health care reform has actually helped us a lot, um, particularly that the behavioral health integration codes um, are now covered by commercial payers. So until we could say that here at Rush, and, and you know, we could have done that even quick soon. You know, we we were a little delayed, honestly, on rolling out our billing structure. But but um, until we could say that patients, you know, can can truly say that their their mental health within primary care is a right and not a privilege, um, we really couldn't get off the ground with with the billing structure. And the reason I bring up billing quite a bit is because I've, I've now learned that once you have a billing structure, you can clean up a lot, you know, from a clinical workflow standpoint, from a documentation standpoint. Um, and, you know, it, it, this is a, a rough time in healthcare, of course, financially. And so for us to be able to say we are ready to, you know, actively bill in this value-based care model, um, We've gotten a lot of resources with Epic programs and and the system because they they they're listening now and they're they're willing to help. So I think that that was the biggest resource for us and more of a catalyst. Um, you know, the electronic health record, of course, has uh, us having that. We're really really fortunate and privileged, I would say, to be at these health systems where we can actually build this this type of pro these type of programs into an EHR. Um, but but a large resource for me personally has been to to sorry to leverage our our residents, our psychiatry residents. Um, they've really taken our model and our program off the ground. Um, and without them, I I, I don't think we could even be able to scale what we're doing. So so there was a, a lot of resourcing from our uh, residents as ambassadors. Dr. Lighterapong or Dr. Rado, do you? Can you speak to some of the resources that you've leveraged or? 
I think I would echo the personnel resources, people. Um, I mean, it's taken, it's a lot of goodwill for my primary care doctors and providers to say, yes, I care just as much about these other things, uh, depression, anxiety, PTSD, trauma, you know, um, AD, adult ADHD, things that were not part of their training um, as within their scope of practice. And then to take that on as their own, you know, as healthcare problems that they say, yes, I, I've got to start those antidepressants. I've got to start screening for PTSD or, or start, start, you know, medications for ADHD, stuff that they haven't been trained to do at all. So a lot of goodwill, a lot of, and then clinical expertise. So we actually have a suite of about a dozen clinical decision support tools, um, which have all been developed in collaboration with a psychiatrist. I'm a general internist. I'm not a psychiatrist. So they've been developed in conjunction with our psychiatrists and psychologists, you know, what medications do you start? Um, and actually, I'm going to put in the chat our website that you can go to that, you know, these are publicly available and, you know, free to use. So I'll put that information there too, so you can get a, if people want to look, they can take a look at what they look like. Dr. Rita. Yeah, so, I mean, a couple things come to mind. I think, I mean, I'm sort of echoing what's already been said. I think people have been a, a big uh, resource that we've leveraged. Yeah, I think the the care managers, which we we use all licensed clinical social workers, they've been a huge component of our program and have been really, I think, the key to their success because they're kind of like the thing that holds everything together between the registry and the PCP and the psychiatrist and the patient, of course. So they've been a huge asset and a really an important part of the success of the program. And I think we've invested really in, in training them and training everybody in the system to understand the program. That's taken a lot of time because integrated care is a different way of, of functioning. It's a different way of working. And it was very odd at the beginning where people said, well, wait, you don't see actually see every single patient. And so that took a lot of education. Well, no, it's a different kind of program where I'm involved in their care, but I don't necessarily see every single patient. So there was a lot of education also for the PCPs, for all the staff in the primary care offices. Um, and then we also really leveraged all the expertise from the psychiatrists. So we got, we managed to get, I think we have four different psychiatrists that work in the program and really getting them involved and invested in the program and, and doing, again, also all doing a lot of education in the hospital in general, but also in the, in the each practice and then even one-on-one -on -one with, with primary care providers explaining to them, you know, what is this and why are we doing this and why is this important and why is this good and why, why would you want to refer someone to us? Um, you know, I think, I think that's been really important. And then I think I hit on this before, but also, again, the, the, the IT aspect of it, there was really, um, it was really important to have all those pieces in place for the registry. And also like Neha mentioned for billing, because that kind of, in you know, our system is also very linked to IT and, and, and billing, you know, it's unfortunately, it's the reality of healthcare today. That's important that we have the support that's needed to make to, you know, to keep programs um, um, alive, so to speak. I just want to put out there, if any of our participants watching have any questions specific for one of our doctors, make sure you can add them in the chat. I have one um, actually that's making me smile. Um, so I'm going to open this up to all three of you, but it says, how do we get non-mental health providers and physicians um, to not freak out when screening for suicide risk? It's a good one, right, Mita? Totally. So, yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, I'll, I'll follow. I can start, and I, this is actually echoing what Neha said earlier, but we had this issue was, is even screening for depression, well, the resistance to screening because we there was no resource to actually send the patient if they screen positive or you know, put somebody on a wait list for six months, you know, how is that really helpful? And the same thing with screening for suicide, if, if you're going to look for it, then you want to have something you can offer the patient, some resource you can give them. So I think we really did a push early on to say, look, we want you to screen, but this is the, the benefit of this program is now you have a place you, we will respond immediately. You have a resource, a referral resource that will respond. I mean, we, we get patients in contact within a week of the referral where they're, you know, scheduled for an intake. And so it's very quick. And I think that's been a really po positive sort of feedback to the to the primary care providers and, and like you said the non-mental health providers to say look you know you're okay asking about this these 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 questions because you've got the support to back you up if you need it i think that's been a huge plus from my standpoint since we don't have a collaborative care program i think um 
you know, it's, it's a heavier lift. Um, it has been a heavier lift. Um, we went the clinical decision support tool route. So we actually have the questions because what happens as a primary care doctor, what happens in my brain is, ah, these green positive for suicide, ah, you know, um, and that was pre me doing this. And so this type of work. Um, so one of the things we did was sort of put the questions of the CSSRS at the ready. They're in the clinic rooms. Um, they're available in Epic. We haven't integrated them perfectly yet because we're not sure we have the capacity to meet all the demand that might be there, right? Um, and but you know we're advocating internally, you know, for more resources all the time. Um, but we actually have a you know a tool like these are the questions you're supposed to ask. This is what you should do. You know, don't forget to ask about you know the previous lecture. Don't forget to screen for guns. Um, don't forget to screen for these other things. You know, substance use disorder and these other things that. Um, are things to be worried about. And then this is when, this is how you triage them. If you need to send them to the emergency department, this is who you call. This is, this is how you fill out a petition. Here's a petition on hand that has templated out for you what you need to fill out in different places to do an involuntary petition. Um, so we, we have all those things at the ready um, so clinicians can feel comfortable. And we also have um, worked care closely with our emergency department on site and they're willing to come up and see patients if we need to send people down. Um, this works really well when you have an emergency department on site. For our offsite um, clinics, we also are working on triaging and trying to improve those systems. Um, but it is, it's a struggle. It, it really, people are really scared um, to do, it, especially from a primary care provider, if they only screen someone positive like once a year, right? So it's not something like managing blood pressure or diabetes, where you do it every day and so you know exactly what to do next. Um, when it's suicide, it's just something you don't do all the time, and so you may not feel comfortable asking the right questions. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Rita, I'm a veteran clinician, and I still get a little anxious waiting for the answer, right? Dr. Gupta, is there anything you want to add about for that I, question? I think part of rolling out um, the you know, the suicidal ideation or screening for suicide on the PHQ-9, what's really important is to also roll out that, you know, the that you we have built in a documentation and coding structure to um, reduce liability for the primary provider by having every single step in the EHR that they need to do. So, you know, I know that we are talking about medical risk, but that's very important. And to be honest, I think that's part of the hesitancy to, to screen because they're very nervous about what will happen to them uh, as primary. So an example, and maybe the other uh, leaders on this call have also done is, um, you know, when the question nine on the suicide screen is, is goes above a certain threshold, then, you know, there's a um, segue over to the Columbia screen in the chart itself. Then from there, if that Columbia screen is above a certain number, then a, a hard stop in the chart comes up and it, the patient requires a one-to-one -one sitter, uh, meaning someone in the clinic has to stay with them and then they have to be triaged to the ER. So it's like every step has been built for the primary provider. And if it's a low risk, then you document that and and it's okay you're allowed to close the chart and document what 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 happened and you will get a response as jeff outlined as well so you know i think built built really building out the structure for primary providers um uh leads to a, to just just a little bit of uh um, you know reprieve from the worries so, so going along with this theme what sort of staff training was necessary to start um, your integration program, and are there any ongoing training needs? Go I guess Dr. I guess Rado, I'll go ahead. Yeah, I'll start. So, well, so our program again is a very specific program. It's using the collaborative care model. So we there are lots of extra online trainings to, that you can do for that. So we had all of our staff, both psychiatrists and the care managers, do that training, and then. We had like sort of one initial care manager who then trained the next one and the next one so that we sort of did like a sequential training where everybody trained under the previous one where there was observation kind of looking at workflow seeing how you use the registry you know how we have like templates for all the calls and so they could observe how the calls done how's the communication done with the pcp because there's a lot of you know communication between different providers so all of that was modeled when when some when the new a new care manager was hired and they could observe and see how that's done um 
the psychiatrists were also sort of trained on how the model works. We've set up some sort of sort of um, guidelines for sort of the treatment, you know, kind of standard ways to treat depression. Though I think most most providers know that, but we we did put that in place. We did, like I said, a lot of uh, education of the actual you know, of the primary care providers in the in the different practices. So we would do an initial meeting, sort of just explain this is what we want to do and this is why it's good, and then we'd come back a second time and do an, sort of a longer in service to explain the model in more detail how to refer people, who to refer, what are the services that are provided, um, you know, how does the communication go once the patient's in the program. So, and then we, I would say we kind of continually do that just to kind of remind people like, well, this is the next step and this is how you refer and this is why you do it. So there's always, because practices always have new providers. So you're always actually kind of having to always educate and re-educate. Um, and then we've also just educated the hospital and I think other people in our department too, because collaborative care is not necessarily understood by everybody who's practicing medicine or psychiatry. So we do a lot of education just to explain the model just to, to our colleagues. We have lots of education as well. Um, sort of different because we're sort of trying to change we're educating lots of different levels around just mental health topics and then resources and then community resources as well as they come out. Um, so we have a website, we have our weekly tip emails that we send out every Friday. I present at the different section meetings. Um, some of the interventions that we're doing have been rolling out into other clinics and other departments, um, OBGYN, pediatrics, geriatrics. Um, and then other people are like, oh, I wanna start screening for depression and mental health problems too. And so like oncology and, and infectious disease and GI, I mean, it's all, everyone's starting to, to get on board on this train. Um, and so I am constantly, you know, having these little meetings with different sections and presenting things and then re-upping and our weekly tip emails, actually, we have, we've been doing it for several years now. So we have a calendar that sort of, you know, okay, every, you know, suicide prevention month that, that we feature something about suicide prevention, you know, early fall, we start talking about seasonal affective disorder, you know, it's sort of like a schedule at this point of things that we have to remind people of that are tied to the year. Um, and so a lot of people, you know, that email goes out to, I spam over 200 people every Friday and no one has asked me uh, to come off my weekly tip email. That's great. Hopefully they're reading it. Right, and I, I'll just uh, say that there's, um, it's, it's hard to keep up with how much training is needed. And I, I'll say that from a clinical perspective, we definitely have not been. Um, in the beginning, it was easier to, um, you know, to definitely give more didactics in our rollouts, but after it kind of spanned the health system, I think that the retrainings that I'll be honest that that's been it's been difficult to keep up with those so that's there's room for improvement for us with that one. But one thing that I'll say that we have stayed up on has been just the blast of leveraging our EHRs to send, you know, snapshots and clinical reminders of exactly how to get to us because without being able to get to us we can't help you know so so that's one part of of uh training up that we've done um another another way of resourcing or training has been um i involved our residents and also a primary provider champion in delivering a train the trainers um lecture series to our practices which was over webex and uh, jeff and i have participated in a national organization on training trainers um psychiatrists really training primary care providers on the essentials of psychiatry um that that was that was useful on the essential uh basic management and also advanced augmentation management. But something that came out of that that I really loved was that we um, found a way to get books to each practice and that's the primary care psychiatry handbook and the text. Um, and I, I just think it's a really well written book about just just outlining, um, just, just kind of outlining basic therapeutics. So I think those all together are how we've kept up with, with training. Uh, I want to be mindful of time, but I would be remiss if we did not bring up COVID-19 and how that has affected um, your practices, the integration, um, you know, how, how, have, how has your clinic adapted 
to um, primary care integration during COVID-19, A, and B, do you think any of those adaptations will remain in place, um, hopefully, when this is over soon? Dr. Leitirapon, do you want to start that one? Sure. Um, I've got some good news and some bad news in response to that. So just by, um, I'm a clinical investigator. So a lot of my time, some of my time is spent, you know, running trials and stuff like that. So just by chance, we ran a patient portal um, trial where we actually had a population health approach to depression assessments for people with history of depression. So half of patients got um, invitations to complete a depression assessment, even if they didn't have a clinic appointment. So it wasn't like a pre-visit assessment. And then half of patients just got usual care. And we launched it in February of last year. And so we're wrapping it up now. Um, but I have to say that that was, um, that was something our providers were so excited to be able to participate in. So that way they could hear if their patients were depressed, suffering at home, filled out a questionnaire, and then my te our teams would reach out to them and sort of get them linked back into care. Um, and my clinicians want that to continue. Um, they want to be able to have a population level approach towards depression assessments in patients who have depression. Um, so the results are look good, you know, but it's a single center trial. So it's not like I would say everyone should go do this right now. Um, things have been challenging. Our integrated behavioral health clinic does run on a lot of warm handoffs and you can't do a warm handoff if you're virtual. Um, that sort of grab that health psychologist, bring them into the room, make the patient feel comfortable in that, you know, triangle of care. Um, can't do that. Um, and so we've tried different models, like where you could do more of like a, like office hours type thing, but you know, it's just hard. I think a lot of the lack of human contact has been really hard on patients and clinicians. Um, we did stand up an urgent, more like an urgent referral system, which I think will continue. So before it was sort of like, no one used that urgent button in the, the referral, or if you used it, we never knew if it actually worked. Um, but now it does work. We made sure that urgent referrals would actually get urgent attention. Um, so that's been good. And then overall for mental health, for our, our, our providers, we've done a whole bunch of work around wellness and compassion fatigue and, and things like that. And, and hopefully we won't need those after COVID ends, um, when it ends, that our, our, we won't need as much support for our providers. Dr. Rado. So in terms of COVID, so there were a couple things we've tried. When, it, when the pandemic started back in the spring, we actually had a team of medical students that were screening actually all of the primary care patients because medical students all of a sudden had a lot of free time on their hands. So they were doing screening, phone screening of all the primary care patients to, and doing like I think it was PHQ-9s and GAT-7s to see who might benefit or might, might need more behavioral health care. Now that didn't actually yield very many patients. It didn't really, didn't lead to a whole lot of increase in care or referrals. Now, more recently, um, we are with, so there's a, a COVID, a comprehensive COVID center at Northwestern and there we're going to, we're actually just becoming part of that. So patients are referred there, patients who have COVID um, are referred there and then they're being screened um, for depression and anxiety. And then they're sort of fast tracked into our program, um, into the collaborative care program so that people can get into care very quickly. So. Dr. Gupta, you could talk really quickly in our last minute if you want to speak about COVID and how it's impacted. Yeah, you know, I mean, I, at first there was a, um, a worry that we would have a drop in referrals, but it's actually just really taken off. Um, and, and, it, and it makes sense because, you know, the virtual work that we get to do in collaborative care and especially because our behavioral health care managers brief interventions with the patients are telephonic and virtual. Um, it's actually really increased um, access to care um, for collaborative care programs. So I think, um, you know, I, I just think it's all the more reason to have programs like this. It is 420 and I want to thank all of you for your time today and for being a part of this and for such collaborative dynamic discussion. Um, for our participate participants, have a great rest of the afternoon and to our panel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Bye. -bye. Bye.